And last but not least, we have Luca Stevenson, who is uh, a male-identified sex worker who co-founded SWARM, which is the sex worker advocacy and resistance movement in the UK. He also coordinates ICRSE, the International Committee on the Rights of Sex Workers in Europe, it's, which is a network of 100 organizations that are working with or led by sex workers in Europe and Central Asia. And then finally, he's also a volunteer representative of the Médecine du Monde, du Monde anti-violence program, Jasmine. Luca. Thank you. So, okay. Um, so I just like this. Oh, hi everyone. Well, it's really a tough gig to speak after uh, everyone today. Um, so, oh, I, think, uh, I think it was good, no? Yeah, right there. Okay. Oh. And uh, so it's a really challenging task to, uh, to speak about uh, the intersection of uh, sex work, uh, drug use, and harm reduction. So I'm going to try to do my best to uh, represent uh, the diversity of, uh, of issues on the, on the topic. Uh, so quickly about our, our organization, ICRSC uh, is a network led by sex workers. We were founded uh, 10 years ago, uh, in 2005, so that's like almost 15 years ago now. And as I say, we work with many uh, organizations uh, in Europe and Central Asia. Uh, we're very excited to, uh, to be here and uh, we'll actually be in Lisbon tonight uh, doing our first training with sex workers uh, with the organization GATT. Uh, so we're very proud about that. And uh, I just wanted to like acknowledge the, the several sex workers who are in the room today and who are doing lots of work at the, at the local, national or other level. Uh, yesterday was very interesting because there was a session with several uh, 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 rep uh, presentations on sex work and sadly there was no sex worker speaking on the panel. And so there was a good conversation uh, led by sex workers about the need of more representation of sex workers on uh, not just on panels but in the in the organization of conferences in harm reduction um, generally so i'll briefly talk about how uh, people who use drugs and sex worker communities intersect uh, the impact of criminalization and repression and specifically uh, legal frameworks and human rights violation and then uh, going towards some, uh, some recommendation towards harm reduction and human rights, social and economic justice for sex workers. Uh, so, I'm going to go back so you don't read it. Uh, I think it's interesting when we talk about harm reduction and sex work because uh, for many sex workers, sex work is not inherently harmful. It means that uh, selling sex, or having sex, having sex for money uh, is not necessarily harmful. What is harmful is all the different uh, repressive laws, policies, uh, practices that frame sex work, the stigma and the discrimination. Having said that, sex work is work, and work is by itself uh, harmful. And it might not be harmful for people who work for NGOs or for funders. For the vast majority of people who work in informal labor, uh, in precarious work, work is harmful. And today is May Day, as Chloe was saying. And I want to say on May Day to remind that like, more than 3 million people globally die of work-related illness accident a year. This is numbers from the International Labor Organization. So when we talk about sex work, we don't think that sex work is necessarily harmful, but we do think that work, and that's why we need good uh, labor conditions to be able to address violence and harm associated with work. So now you can read the panel slide. Um, and so when we talk about uh, intersection of sex workers and, uh, and people who use drugs, uh, we have to understand like the double stigma and discrimination uh, faced by sex workers who use drugs as well within communities. I've got many friends, uh, sex workers who use drugs, who don't come out about being a drug user even within the sex worker movement. We have to understand that it's beyond the simple uh, causal relation, just saying that, oh, sex workers sell sex in order to buy drugs, or sex workers are victims of post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and it's drugs to, um, to heal the trauma, or like to, uh, to support the work they're doing. I realize I only have 10 minutes left and that's the first slide. Um, so we're often also reduced to, uh, to cis female uh, uh, sex workers injecting drugs, uh, which is of course like a very important part of our community and often the most precarious, the most vulnerable. But uh, we ignore that like 
sex workers who use drugs are many other, uh, fit into many other categories, from male sex workers uh, involved in the chem sex scene and how it impacts uh, our capacities to, uh, to consent or to have safe sex, uh, steroid use. For trans sex workers, the injections of hormones and silicones and, uh, and the danger associated with it. Uh, for female sex workers, the mandatory alcohol consumption in sex work venues such as bar, karaoke's, etc. And there is really not enough understanding of the overlap of mental health, drug use, sex work, violence, consent, and access to justice. And by that, I mean that most sex workers' access to justice is extremely limited because when we try to report actual violence or crime committed against us, we are being denied um, support or access to justice. We are told that as sex workers, we deserve violence or it's part of the job. And this is even more true when, uh, for sex workers who use drugs. One thing that is over, absolutely not talked about, is young people who use drugs and sell sex. So as sex workers, we are told that we are victims, that we are not able to take decisions about our life, which have many uh, parallels with people who use drugs. But there's absolutely no understanding of young people who use drugs and sell sex. Uh, you know, up to like 50,000 children and young people are injecting drugs in Ukraine, for example, and we know that many people survive through sex work. However, there is no understanding and no research and no nuance about discussion on, on this topic. Um, you can read more information about, these two, uh, about the intersection on these two papers. One is done by NSWP, the Global Network uh, of Sex Work Projects, and input on the uh, experience of sex workers who use drugs, as well as a report from, uh, from Harm Reduction International. So, go back to like, the main issues faced by sex workers globally. As you know, sex workers, as well as people who use drugs, are amongst some of the most marginalized and stigmatized communities globally. Um, what we are facing is a huge amount of violence, uh, physical violence, sexual violence, psychological violence, murder. Uh, we see our workplaces being closed down, uh, such as uh, raids on brothels in many countries, uh, shutting down of websites like what's happening now in the US with Fosta and Sesta. Uh, police repression and arrest, deportation of migrant sex workers under the guise of uh, supporting or protecting victims of trafficking. Uh, violence by authorities, clients, people posing as clients, uh, bribe and corruption. And often the most marginalized sex workers are the more at risk, and in particular migrant sex workers, black and people of color, indigenous sex workers, trans and drug users. And, um, and we often, like, even though we might not be directly criminalized through sex work, we are often criminalized through other offenses, such as uh, homelessness, drug use, homosexuality, or cross-dressing. Um, and I think it's very important to, to understand that uh, that as, as sex worker, we are calling for the decriminalization of sex work. And we're actually calling for the decriminalization and the end of legal oppression. Decriminalization is just the first step, and it's been proven that it's the best way to protect sex workers' rights. But that's just part of the, like, that's really the first step in the battle for recognition of sex workers' rights. I was trying to find more information about the impact of the, of the, the war on drugs in Philippine uh, sex workers. And actually, just this week, uh, a report, like an article was published. And I just have a quick quote. Yeah. Uh, so from this, uh, from this brochure that's appeared on Anti-Trafficking Review uh, two days ago, uh, the researchers say five sex workers I interviewed had lost their partner to these extrajudicial killings. One said, the police raided our house and demanded that we produce names of drug sellers, but we didn't know anyone. I was jailed for six months, they took my husband back to our house and killed him here. Two of them entered sex work after their partners were killed in order to support their children. The other three had to engage in sex work more frequently after their par partner's death. As I was mentioning, there is currently two main legal frameworks which are being uh, proposed, opposed, discussed. One is pushed by sex workers and many other organizations, Amnesty International, WHO, a uh, large amount of like, academic evidence behind it and is decriminalization of sex work. And the other one, uh, called the Swedish model, is uh, recognizing prostitution as a form of violence against women. And the only way to end the arm in prostitution is to abolish prostitution altogether. And the only way to abolish prostitution is through criminalization, criminalization of clients in this, in this sense. Uh, Sweden criminalized clients in uh, 1999, and we are celebrating this year, 20 years of failing sex workers in Sweden and, uh, and globally. Since then, many countries have implemented the criminalization of clients, such as Norway, France, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Norway again, twice apparently. Um, 
The key issue is that, in that sense, sex work is conflated with trafficking. And again, the same with like, the, the war on drugs, there is absolutely no evidence behind this. We know that majority of sex workers in Europe, for example, are migrants, and they can be facing exploitation, bad working conditions, debt, etc. But to say that all migrant sex workers or all sex workers are victims of trafficking is just simply a lie, and there's absolutely no evidence behind it. Um, and that's when it comes to who defines violence and harm. This is a quote from, uh, I'm, I'm based in Scotland, I know I don't really have the accent, but this is a quote from the Scottish government. Activities such as pornography, prostitution, stripping, lap dancing, pole dancing, table dancing, all type of dancing, are forms of commercial sexual exploitation. These activities have been shown to be harmful to the individual women involved, have a negative impact on the position of all women through the objectification of women's body. This happens irrespective of whether individual women claim success or empowerment from the activity. And for me, this is so key to how people seem to know better than sex workers themselves if sex work is violence or not. I talk to lots of my stripper, lap dancing, table dancing friends, as well as like sex workers, other sex workers. They don't necessarily claim empowerment or success from this activity. They just claim money. The only reason they're doing it is to make a living, to, you know, to pay their bills, to pay for the education of their kids, to pay for their transition, whatever reasons. Uh, and to say that actually, even if you say that you're okay with it, it's actually harmful, is the, is the core of the issue. Defining prostitution as a form of violence is actually a huge insult to all the survivors of violence out there, including sex workers. As a sex worker who's a survivor of violence, like many of my friends, I know the difference between rape and between uh, sex war. I can exchange sex for money with my clients, and this is sex war. If I'm being raped, I really know the difference. And this is so insulting and so problematic to all sex workers and feminists out there who have fought so hard to be recognized that when we say no, it's no. But when we say yes, it's yes to, like, to have a feminist position such as the Swedish government. Thank you. To have the like, uh, organizations such as the European Women Lobby of France or many uh, feminist organizations, not all, a huge part of the feminist movement is supporting sex workers, denying sex workers' capacities to define violence is really the core of the problem. Uh, as I was mentioning, as also a volunteer for Médecins du Monde, the Jasmine Project, which is an anti-violence project in France, uh, there's been this research done by uh, Médecins du Monde in France, a very in-depth research, that's what this slide says. And here is the result. Three years after the criminalization of clients in France, 63% of sex workers have experienced deterioration of their living condition, more isolation, and greater stress. 78% of sex workers have experienced a loss of income due to the decrease of number of clients and fall of rates. I mean, this is pretty obvious. If you're going to criminalize my clients, if I'm going to have less clients, then I'm just going to have less money. If I'm going to have less money, then I won't be able to negotiate condom, for example, like I used to. I will accept clients who I know are dangerous. I might accept uh, some sexual services I would have refused before. And that's what sex workers say. 38% of sex workers find it increasingly hard to demand use of condoms. 42% are more exposed to violence. And 70% observe no improvement or deterioration of their relation with the police. Last year, uh, um, I don't know if I can do that now. OK. So last year, a sex worker was murdered in France. I'm talking about her today because there was a lot of action. She was not the only sex worker murdered in France or murdered globally. A huge amount of sex workers are murdered, and we have very li often little data about it because often the police is the perpetrator, and often the, the information doesn't come up. Vanessa Campos was a trans woman from Peru. She. Um, she was a trans woman from Peru. She moved to France at the moment where the client criminalization passed. She was walking in the street in the, in the Bois de Boulogne in France, which is a forest near Paris, selling sex uh, to survive and to send money back home to her mother, who was trying to build a small house in the rural Peru. Uh, she was murdered. The weapon was a police gun. And, uh, and what's very shocking to me is that for months, Vanessa and her friends, trans uh, Latina women in the forest of Paris, were telling the police that they knew that a gang was uh, harassing them, were threatening them, were actually stealing the money from the clients who are criminalized. And Vanessa and her colleague tried to push back against that. The police laugh at them, uh, a racist joke, transphobic joke, etc. until the moment where actually Vanessa was murdered. This sparked a day of action uh, in many countries and cities, people calling for justice for Vanessa, uh, Vanessa Campos. However, 
we, are, uh, we have many success uh, currently with the sex worker movement, with uh, Amnesty International and many organizations supporting the decriminalization of sex work, the LGBT global movement, and the president of South Africa, for example, uh, promising to decriminalize sex work. But we see all these great recommendations at the global level, but the national level is actually going way uh, backward. And in particular with the Swedish model pushed uh, by France and Sweden now as like a key uh, uh, diplomatic uh, mission. Mm. Oh, actually, it's the last slide. Um, so just a few recommendations as we move forward. As a, as a sex worker movement, we are calling for more collaboration between sex workers and people who use drugs movement and more inclusion into harm reduction. Harm reduction should also include sex workers, whether they use drugs or not. A meaningful involvement of sex workers in programs and advocacy. And as has been said all along the, the, the conference, it is not difficult to include sex workers. Yesterday, we had the whole panel and there was no sex worker speaking. That shouldn't happen in a conference like this, and that should happen in your program. You need to include sex workers and people who use your drugs in your program. And we're obviously asking for greater intersectionality, uh, inclusion of migrants, trans, black and ethnic minority, people living with disability, indigenous sex workers. And this is not just to like tick some, uh, some score and be like, oh, you know, we have, you know, this intersectionality is very important, we need to tick. Is you can't do a program without involving the most vulnerable in this program. And finally, we ask for your support to the criminalization of sex work. And we ask you to also really understand that we have to, yes, put politics before Put, bef <laughs> what? put people before politics. But you know, as a worker, as a sex worker, as a member of the trade union movement, we are also asking you to like, reclaim politics. We live in a world that is extremely going fast toward fascism. We cannot talk about sex workers' rights or people who use drugs' rights without talking poverty, without talking about the huge uh, imbalance of power uh, between rich and poor and how fast this is going towards uh, ignoring the rights of the most marginalized. So thank you very much and sorry for delay. If you can join me in, in thanking our panelists. This was amazing. Thank you one more time. Thank you. That was curated very well, Naomi. I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate you. So there's going to be a slight change of plans. We're not, we don't have time for a Q&A right now. Oh, wait. I have to read something specific. Sorry. Uh, we don't have time for a Q&A uh, because we're going to ask you to join us in doing something. Um, up to 35,000 people have been killed in the drug war that is taking place in the Philippines, and I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. 35,000 people. So what you see is the Stop the Killing banner, and it's traveled to cities across the world from Manila to Bogota to Washington, D.C., and today it's here in Port Porto with us. So please join us in solidarity right now by gathering at the back of the building by the river for a photo in front of, of the banner. So what we'd like you to do is go straight downstairs, and Naomi said that I am told, uh, I am, uh, I'm to tell you to look for the big, tall American guy named Matt. <laughs> um, and then on your way out, please remember to give your translation headsets to the staff and volunteers as you exit. Thank you so much. It's a great conference. Thank you.